Hi, welcome to another episode of Build a Better. I'm your host, Jesse Tomchak. Today, we're talking with Fred from Astro Build. How are you, Fred? Doing great. Thanks for having me on. Fantastic. We've got Jay and Tom from This Thought. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about static site generators. Um, really, there's been so much sort of talk about uh, server-side generation with uh, Remix and Redwood and some of the other ones. But Astro has seemed to sort of slide in... Uh, in a pretty well-defined area, right? We've all used Jekyll for you know, a decade ago and then Hugo and some of the other ones. So uh, for our audience, Fred, could you give us a, a rundown of what Astro is for anyone who hasn't heard about it? And then, and then I really want to hear why Astro, when like everybody else is doing server-side generation, static generation, dynamic generation, you sort of went over here and did just static builds. Yeah. So tell me, tell me about it, and then, and then help me understand like, what, what itch you were scratching, why? Yeah, definitely. I'd, I'd be happy to. It's a space that I spent a lot of time in, so definitely have been exploring and using all of these different tools, most of the ones you mentioned. And having built a bunch of websites, really realizing that all of those tools that you mentioned um, were targeting a much more complex type of website, where like a website almost becomes a web application. And that's been really popular over the last five years because it's super powerful, but you end up building something that has to be much more dynamic, even if what you were trying to build wasn't super dynamic. So for example, e-commerce, marketing, websites, blogs, there's a huge part of the website, uh, sorry, of the internet that is mostly static content. And what we saw when we looked to start building Astro is that they weren't being best served by the current set of tool sets, by Next.js, Redwood, all fantastic tools for building applications, falling a bit short in our mind in terms of building a content-based website. So Astro is really a site builder that's focused on anyone building mostly static content, e-commerce, um, you know, marketing materials, landing pages, blogs, and anything that's all about getting content to you, the, the viewer or the user of the website as quickly as possible. And Astro gets to bring some really cool technology into the mix when we focus on that use case. Um, and that's where I think a lot of the most interesting exploration over the last year has been in terms of what we can do when we start to focus on not being the best application builder, but the best website builder and bringing in really cool technology like partial hydration to make that happen. Yeah, so partial hydration, let's, I think, is this a sort of like uh, marquee feature of Astro Build is this idea of partial hydration and and sort of zero dependency uh, or zero JavaScript on load. Yeah, it's definitely the one that we kind of got biggest for, um, and it's kind of the first like the the gateway drug into Astro. Um, so what it means is that you can instead of thinking of your entire website as one big application, start thinking of your website as different islands of interactivity. Um, island architecture is the term for this um, that uh, Jason Miller of Preact had originally coined. But we're the first site builder to kind of bring this to you without you having to really think about it. And so the idea is your content's your content, your images are your images. You don't need JavaScript to load most of the stuff on your page. And you just bring in JavaScript when you need like the buy button or the shopping cart or the really expensive image carousel. And when you start to break apart your website in that way, and again, Astro basically does this for you for free, um, you start to be able to optimize those different islands differently. So for example, an expensive image carousel, you can tell to only load when you scroll to it, when it becomes visible. And that's very different from the current way of uh, delivering applications where the whole thing gets bundled into a single thing. So you end up with that uncanny valley of the site gets sent to you, maybe it's server-side rendered, but then you have to load the entire page afterwards before anything becomes interactive. And there've been a lot of different ways to try and solve that problem, but Astro is really the first one that looks at it as not a framework problem, but as a architecture problem. And we basically for free give you the ability to start breaking apart your website and shipping most of it down the wire as pre-rendered, totally static, without turning the whole page into a non-interactive you know, block. Yeah, I, I remember wishing that something that Astro existed a few years ago when I was working on this project where we had a very interactive application, but we had certain marketing pages, um, pre-registration for it that were completely static and we really need to optimize them. And I actually ended up building this thing where we had a React server-side render 
that just wouldn't hydrate these pages and would just manually have manually written script tags for the interactivity that they needed. Um, and because we wanted the React components, but we didn't really want to hydrate all of this, and we didn't want to start the hydration yet. Uh, and I think you were like, oh, if, if only there was an, an easy way to do this thing that is conceptually is pretty easy, like oh, hydrate this bit, not, not this bit. Um, yeah. But there wasn't a way to do it. Yeah, we had a really similar experience where we had built, um, a lot of us had been working on Snowpack at the time, which is a, another build tool. And we launched a new website for that. And all of a sudden, um, Alex Russell reached out and said, this is so fast. How did you do it? What did you do? Like, how did this work? And Alex Russell is this like performance, like old man shakes fist at clouds kind of guy on Twitter, like always jumping in advocating for web performance, even as a lot of the web has really kind of taken that as a secondary seat to developer experience. Um, and is you know constantly just kind of shaking that tree. And what we realized is we built it with 11D, which is a really cool, another static builder, a static site builder. But we had to do all of this like hydration on our own. So 11D, we realized it was this like kind of brain flip where you start to think of your baseline as HTML and you're bringing in the framework components when you want them. So for example, we had plenty of dynamic pages of that. Um, we had a way to browse plugins and a way to search the site. But we were thinking as site builders first in terms of HTML as our base layer. So Astro is the same kind of idea where it's it's still giving you all the same tools. You can bring in React, you can bring in Vue, Svelte, uh, SolidJS. You can support all of these frameworks either as interactive client components or even to render your site um, into HTML on the server and they never get sent to the user. But in all those cases, really the method of thinking has changed where you're starting to think in terms of HTML first, JavaScript when you need it. So you can do all the same stuff but really that mental flip, just as a default, encourages you to ship much faster websites without really limiting what you can do um, ultimately. Do you think the, the conversation of sort of, uh, you know, Alex Russell is famous for, for shaking fist at, at large JavaScript payloads. Uh, and I often hear him in my head when I'm like just shoehorning hydration into these next JS pages. Uh, I'm like, it's fine. And it'd be like, Alex Russell would kill me if you saw this. Um, <laughs> you like, you'd never hear the end of it. Uh, the the story recently with like Remix and some of the other ones has been using and leveraging the platform. Is, is that sort of um, conversation helped Astro in, in advancing just the HTML for like, in so many years, I've never heard so much talk about HTML first and JavaScript after as I have in like the last six months. Yeah, a year ago, no one was really, like we really pushed a lot of these ideas out, not on our own, but like right place, right time. A year ago, no one was talking about this. And last year at the Jamstack Awards, like all anyone was being asked about was partial hydration. What's your partial hydration story? Um, how are you gonna like match this feature that Astro has? And it just speaks to like, it's a totally different way to think about your website that we think is better for content sites. So Remix, I think, is following a similar kind of spiritual model, which is what you learn in Remix should map to fundamental web things. So you're not learning a totally custom thing. You're learning web native, like web primitives, web platform things, so that when you leave to learn, leave the next thing, you bring that knowledge with you. It's a good place to spend your time. Um, Astro is very much invested in that, but we've just totally flipped the idea of, you know, at the end of the day, Remix is still a React application. You're spending most of your time in React it might give you a lot more control over what you're putting on the page so that it's not invisible the way it is with Next.js or Gatsby. Um, Remix is really good about making you think about the whole page as an artifact. So you're adding your scripts and you're adding your head, you're doing all these things. But at the end of the day, you're adding your scripts and it's just a kind of, it's a light switch, it's on off. Um, it doesn't give you that same granularity that a partial hydration or islands architecture can. So I love what they're doing. I think it's the right way that web developers should be thinking about choosing their next tool. Um, we're just trying to optimize for a different use case that is more content site focused and more about controlling at an individual component by component level what your page ends up looking like at the end of the day. It's in a way, really, it's returning to tradition. It is, or or viewed in another way, it's like the you know Hegelian synthesis of the server side and client side approaches where we were saying, oh, HTML 
first and JavaScript is an afterthought that's really difficult to work with. Or, and then we went to know everything's JavaScript and HTML is an afterthought that's very difficult to work with. Yep. Um, and now we're getting to this, this synthesis of, well, you can, you can use JavaScript to create HTML. And so there doesn't really need to be a, a, a hard boundary to navigate there. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it's one of the things that like Astro just kind of feels fun to write. So you can use all these frameworks or you can use our own custom component syntax, which is kind of like we took the best of all these frameworks, but because it's trying to render HTML at the end of the day, we never really have to worry about reactivity. What happens if a user clicks this or the state changes? It's like we get to build this really fun, basic um, component system that will feel familiar whether you're coming from like React with JSX or Svelte or Vue with their single file components. Um, but it ends up feeling like the, and this is like my favorite criticism because it's almost exactly the point. Um, our syntax, it almost is harkening back to like the PHP days where you would put like your PHP code and mix it with HTML. And like, you'd kind of have this big mess, but it was really easy because it was all just like, how do I render this HTML at the end of the day? We're like that, but for 2022, where you actually have a nice separation of server code running and then preparing your template as a component but in a way that like really harkens back to that simplicity of, you know, we can put server code here and put your template here and you don't have to think about it as all as JavaScript. At the end of the day, the template feels a lot like HTML with your logic injected in where you need it. Um, it's one of my favorite things when I hear just people who maybe don't like JavaScript as much or who are coming from more of a WordPress background, which is still a huge part of the web. Uh, the modern Jamstack movement is so powerful, but it's alienated a lot of those developers by exactly what you're talking about, the move into all JavaScript, all the things JavaScript. We're kind of trying to bring that same developer experience, but to an audience that maybe doesn't want all JavaScript. They want to explore something new that feels more familiar and is ultimately more about writing HTML and creating HTML than it is building the best application um, using JavaScript. Yeah, having worked um, on Astro for quite a few months now, it is it is very good to be able to say like, oh, what's the, What's the data fetching story? Well, it's a wait fetch. <laughs> yeah, that's a great example of what we can do, um, like where Svelte and Vue really can't because you put in a wait call in our setup, like that's just gonna, we're gonna, while you're rendering your site at the build time, we're gonna go and basically run that await and, and wait for it to kind of return that data. Uh, but any other kind of component in that world, you're gonna have to like, okay, well, hold on, I'm in the middle of compiling your front and you want me to stop completely? What are you talking about? I gotta get this component out the door. Like user needs to click it. The like use case is just totally different. So it's one of those fun things where a lot of people come to Astro with their framework, but the more they use Astro, the more they see the power of this, you know, I'm just writing server side uh, component at the end of the day. So why not write something that's much closer to the HTML and doesn't have to worry about the same concerns that just, uh, you know, a Svelte or a Vue or even a React in some different cases just can't support. I'm interested in the idea, like we, you've mentioned Vue and Svelte and, and React and other frameworks. The idea that I can write in any of those under Astro, was that a tenet of Astro build from the beginning or did that sort of show up after several iterations? Cause like, I think of, you know, like Gatsby was just like, they're either this or that, like you have to choose, like Hugo, you're gonna write in Go. And yeah. like this, I, I don't know that I've, stumbled across a, a, a like a, a static generator like this that is a less framework agnostic than than this yeah yeah it, it's so intentional and like exactly what isn't possible when everything's javascript you kind of have to build it all into that framework and don't get me wrong you get a lot of cool power out of that but you're trapped and tied to that framework of your choice so next js i can't imagine how they would ever support another framework Salt Kit, Nox, all of those, they're betting on a framework and they're just saying like, as long as you stay within this garden, um, we're gonna give you these features. And what you end up with then is everyone's kind of reinventing the wheel over and over again. You get, you know, here's our file-based routing, here's this routing, and they're all doing the same amount of work when ultimately the only thing that makes them special is that they're using their framework to do these things. And so there's this really cool conceptual thing that I'm super excited about as a person building it is that instead of saying, oh, we have to reinvent the wheel and support all these different things, it's much more about, can we create this common layer that everyone can come to that's targeting the server side build stuff? So it's targeting your routing, 
It's targeting the rendering of your page. It's targeting your plugins and your build and how you bring in CSS and styling. And then that lets you just, you know, React can do what it does best, which is UI and Svelte and Vue. Um, you can bring these in for the UI that you need, whether it's fully server rendered or has some interactivity on the client. Uh, because we treat HTML as the baseline, it actually isn't a lot of our work for us. It's easier for us to just say, yeah, sure, we're completely agnostic to what you want to put on your page. The magic's in Astro, and you're bringing your interactivity to us. Um, and that lets us create this common platform for any framework. So, you know, whatever comes after React when it does come, um, you know, solid JS, not that that's the next big thing, but it certainly was a huge splash, and we were one of the first to support it out of the box. And our story was so incredible because it wasn't like, okay, throw out your whole code base and start a hello world with solid. It was like, no, no, just take your site and bring in solid. It can live alongside React. It can live alongside any other framework and play around with it. Try it out. Maybe you want to ship something because it's so lightweight. It's not really going to affect your performance to add solid um, or don't. And just, you know, you've had that actual hands-on experience in your application. It's not some example you had to spin up that's totally div divorced from what you've been building. So there's so much cool stuff. Like it's one of those things that like the more you pull at that thread, just the more interesting it gets. And it's one of my favorite things about Astro as a maintainer. Yeah, and I was ho thinking that it will also, hopefully, you know, whenever there's a new framework, um, maybe it won't need to worry about some of these things of like, you know, oh, if you're developing a new framework or you have a good idea on, on how to handle rendering and how to handle reactivity, you don't have to have like a this uh, server, a dev server story, a routing story and all that, because, you know, these these sort of concerns are actually, they're not really concerns of the, of the view layer. It's just that because of how we developed apps, they sort of became so. And, and I think, I mean, R the React team were quite, were, were I think the ones that were quite strict in saying, no, like, like routing isn't a React thing. And this isn't like, it's just a view layer. Um, but in other ones, like there was this expectation that no, you you have to be able to to build everything in this like very separate context, as opposed to being a library that just handles the yeah the interactivity part. Yeah, it really comes out of this. I I think it can be traced back to that SPA movement where like create React app. If anyone used that, like that was really like kind of I think one of the big first like everything's React. Like we're just going to give you an index.html. You're creating the spa. It's all one big JavaScript application. And that had some huge developer wins, but spas have really fallen out of favor unless you tie them to something that's like Next.js or, or like SvelteKit or Next, where it's now doing the like server-side rendering for free for you automatically. Um, so it was almost this like, oh, hold on, there's something special here for the developer. Can we almost like back out of that and add something that's also going to be good for users? And they got like 90% of the way there, but at the end of the day, Next.js, like I, I love it. I still use it myself, but it's really good at applications. And we see Astro as being much better for a website where you don't want everything to be meshed together in a big uh, complex, like, you know, unless it's a dashboard or something that's really fully dynamic, most of the website doesn't need that complexity. And I think that really came out of that single page app movement, which great for Jamstack, great for the web, but um, everything kind of flowed out from there. Um, as a as a developer and as a uh, you know open source tooling evolved. Is there anything special in um, you mentioned Next.js? And I think most of us have had projects in Next that have been like, okay, here are the static marketing pages, and here's the dynamic application. Um, if I throw Astro and Next.js in a mono repo, is there any special wiring that I need to do to have those pages or have those? those two builds will sort of live in harmony or is it just some sort of uh, sub routing that I do at the, at the, like the base layer? Yeah, that's a great question. So there's a couple aspects of that. Um, one is if you had a Next.js application, you could probably move most of that components either into an Astro project or share them between the two with almost zero issues. Um, obviously if you're using some special magic that you created yourself, it's hard to speak to that, but Astro supports React. It's just you know React. So there's this really nice story for migrating from one to the other. Um, there's very little lock-in if you're just bringing your components along for the ride. Um, where it gets interesting is Astro today is just a static site builder. So you can imagine running your Astro build. It gives you a piece of your website or a couple pages or multiple pages. And 
hosting that somewhere alongside your Next.js application would make total sense. Um, you know, it kind of depends on how your host works for how you go about that. Um, or if you're using Next.js to create a stack site, maybe they could live together in harmony. Um, sometimes people ask like, will there be a way to bring Astro to Next.js or vice versa? They're pretty separate tools. They're both kind of trying to do the same thing. So by definition, they don't play as well together as they uh, maybe could in, in our imagination. Um, but they can certainly live alongside each other in harmony um, and both build different parts or different things. So imagine a marketing site that's sitting in front of a really dynamic application that's like really dashboards and profiles and updates and all these things. That would make total sense to build your marketing site with Astro and then build your actual application with React and, and the Next.js. And you could even share components between the two without too much issue. Um, stuff like that is super built into where we see Astro fitting into the web uh, going forward. Yeah, I just, I've seen this, like the opportunity for that I've seen is like 90% of my application is just static, right? It just builds on on new posts or builds on web hooks and, and, and there's that, just that one page, it's like dynamic enough where it's like, it's, it's either got uh, a web socket and we're, we're feeding stuff in there or it's constantly pulling or it's, or it's as, as interactive as possible. And it's just that one little tiny sliver. Um, maybe we should move everything into Astro and leave that out there in, in its own sort of place. Yeah. yeah, but then you get into the, do you even need Next.js? Um, and what is it, you know, if you, yeah, if you're not leveraging it to as an either, either a static site generator or a server render, you know, there the, it can just be React, right? It can just be inside Astro because that's what ended up happening with, um, with us, with the project we were working on with Astro. The way it evolved, a, a lot of it ended up being hydrated, a lot more than we thought. Um, uh, we thought it was it's less islands and more lakes. <laughs> um, I like that. Uh, but even so, it was it was fairly painless to to move that slider because with React, the the it's unlimited interactivity, right? In the in the extreme, everything could be hydrated, and then it's the same as a Next.js app, um, except I guess routing between pages uh, is done through a through a page refresh instead of Next client site routing, which. It's, I think it's interesting, and I wonder if people have thoughts on that, because uh, I think with the big spam movement, there was this idea that, well, actually, like client-side routing is, is really quick, and it's really sort of snappy, that interactivity. But um, um, I think Remix has been definitely talking about this idea that, no, actually, like, you know, having just anchor tags and going back to the server on each navigation you're actually being able to leverage all of these things out the platform, like like your browser's loading. If it's loading, it's not it's not a a spinner on the web page, and um, you know the the back and forwards browser buttons will always work, not only if you set it up correctly and things like that. Um, so I wonder if if it's the client side routing and everything that that is required to make that happen, like like using you know non-standard link components is just is, is is going on its way out yeah yeah you definitely when you start thinking that way you start to realize are these things that we do today popular because that's the best way for me to build this website or is it because that's the best way for how next.js is designed or uh, a client-side router is designed um yeah i certainly had my my own you know uh, i feel like everyone probably fights with their client-side router at some point in their uh, front-end career and for a lot of cases, it's it's not really the thing you need. It's the thing that you get by virtue of the other tools you've chosen. So um, yeah, and, and to kind of what you spoke on, there's definitely a use case for Astro where if you want to bring your entire page in as one big island, I really like that idea of a, like lakes. Um, that's that's totally valid. That can be, you know, we render it ahead of time. It will hydrate later. Like that's still a good use of Astro if that works for you. Um, it can also just, again, to that story of like migration, it's much more piecemeal. You can start there, ship that. And then as you go, start to break it out. Um, as we grow, that'll only get easier with more tools for sharing state across islands and uh, more control over how these islands can talk to each other and um, you know styling across them. There's plenty of room to grow here. Um, that you know, it's all about making that migration from what you have today to an Astro project as easy as possible. Yeah, 
Now, one of the tools that uh, popped up on my radar when I was going through the AstroDocs was the RSS build uh, that's sort of baked in, um, mostly because I've had to uh, I've had to put RSS in Next.js apps more than I care to, and it like pains me in a in a really deep deep layer. Because um, like you know, uh, you might be like this. Uh, I've read RSS for many many years, right? And and listened to many many podcasts. And like RSS is like a foundational cornerstone of of my consumption. But any site I put together, like especially with Next or or View or something, it's like. Well, you can build RSS, but you're going to have to sort of, you know, go find a plugin, go find a library, sort of iterate over the build steps yourself and stuff it all in the XML yourself. It's like hand rolled artisan RSS. <laughs> and then I, I go to your site and I see like this large anchor. that's just like this large tag. It's like, oh, RSS. And I'm just like, y you pretty much had me at that moment. But like, why is it in there? Is it something that, that you have an affinity for or like, because honestly, on a list of features, RSS is pretty low on that on that totem pole for most people. Yeah, I mean, again, it all goes back to what you're building. If you're building an application, that's you know what what RSS do you have to point to? What what content feed do you have to point to? Um, but early on, we just saw a ton of our developer love and attention coming from people building blogs, um, you know, other sorts of just like content being posted and updated and, and pushed to the world, and. For that user, there, like you said, it's it's something that we don't think about a lot. But um, I've definitely written my fair share of hand rolled artisan uh, XML RSS feeds because there was nothing that existed for me to pull from. Um, so as developers, we just came to this problem, and once we realized that's who seemed to benefit the most from Astro, it became a no brainer to add it uh, into our into our tool and just have it be built in from the get go. Yeah, I'm currently moving my blog from Next to Astro for that reason alone <laughs> yes um, so that so you you've got me hooked there you go because i was i was writing my own rss and i was just like this is i don't want to do this <laughs> uh, so i put it off for a really good part of like two years three years yeah. now uh and now it's like oh i'll just move to astro because it was still for me. I was like that's easy I, that's a way better option yeah and that all comes back to the story we've been telling i think we came as developers like we love this idea of partial hydration and it's just totally exploded from like wait a second why is everything I use to build my blog feel so heavy and complicated? Or when I'm just trying to learn web development, why am I the first thing I'm learning is how JSX and Next.js build. And this site that I built with React, all of a sudden it's this huge payload that I didn't expect. All I'm writing is a blog. When you start to ask those questions, that was, I think, the most exciting moment for Astro when we realized there's nothing really else like this out here that feels modern. Um, again, we, we pull a ton of inspiration from Levity and Hugo, some of those static site builders you mentioned. But all of them come with this templating syntax that feels like it's coming from uh, a past generation of web development, one that I definitely spent plenty of time with. And I think React was a move away from that very intentionally. Developers saying, we want to think in components. We don't want to think in mustache tags and um, you know all these different ways to do HTML templating that came from a world where there just was no client to really rely on at that level. So we're bringing that back. We're trying our best to just like, Realizing that con content creators and people working on WordPress sites or anything that's more on the content web, um, trying to be the best possible tool for them. And yeah, like like you said, RSS is kind of a no brainer once you start thinking that way. Yeah, the, um, and I definitely think like between RSS and sitemaps, those are two things which I definitely like when you see them, I'm like, yeah, that's that's much more up in the list of features that like, um, site builder framework should have much yeah. more than than you know some of the other things that that sometimes get included in like next next js and things it's like yeah i mean these are basic you know these are basic standards of the web sitemaps especially is something that i have also spent a lot of time um creating hand rolled yeah. <laughs> sitemaps it's like every site needs one yeah. this is a, a very basic thing of, of creating any website yeah um, it's, that, it's built in for free with astro yeah that's yeah. another another yeah. thing but i wonder if again if it's if it's one of these like organizational things where the developers building these web apps the, their SE, the seo people were a different team that, that sort of handled the sitemap and so it was never a core concern but it, it's nice to see that brought in as a yeah we're building a website 
and it's it's everything you need to to do that yeah yeah i think there's you know it's it's like what the entire world is dealing with right now which is like maybe twitter isn't representative of reality and i think even we as tooling builders and, and developers who spend time in open source suffer from that where you know facebook you know pushes react forward um, Vercel is all about Jamstack, Netlify, and Gatsby, and all these different tools are really, I think at the end of the day, we're all designing for ourselves. We, we know what we want, and if you come from a background at a company like Facebook, you're building an application. And I think it's, uh, the stat that always blows my mind, even, in, you know, I, I look at it all the time, is 40, I think, percent of the web is still WordPress. And if you go to Twitter, that's not at all what it feels like. And so I think we forget that that is a common story around um, maybe the people who are designing these tools maybe don't have to build site maps. They've, they've graduated past the worrying about SEO. That's the marketing team. But um, for a lot of us, it's all the same problem. It's the same website that needs to think about all these things. So um, yeah, the content, I think last I saw content-based websites make up 60% of the internet. I and mean, it's definitely doesn't feel that way represented by you know checking Hacker News or Twitter. So um, again, we, we just see a ton of people coming to Astro from that more WordPress, HTML-based background and fallen in love with these things that we deliver for free. Um, that's been probably the most rewarding part of it. I'm curious a uh, bit about the experience of people uh, coming from sort of that background and particularly with uh, content sites. So like I'm a coder, I've been using static sites for probably a decade now, all my blog contents in Markdown and everything just builds whenever I push something new to GitHub. If I'm coming from WordPress, I don't necessarily have that same background. Um, so what is the experience like for people dealing with maybe a headless CMS like Contentful or a headless WordPress site? How is Astro handling bills with dynamic content? Um, is, is that easier, comparable to other uh, static front ends? Like if, say, I wanted to have 11D in front of a WordPress site. Yeah, it's it's pretty comparable, and you know, Jamstack is a big ecosystem. So Astro is definitely trying to talk to any CMS you want to throw at it, um, any service you might be using behind the scenes. Astro is designed to work for it. So we have this really nice separation of here's your template, it's HTML, and then above that, um, here's your code that's loading the data, it's preparing the data that's going to be fed into the template, all in one single file component type way of thinking. So you can fetch from WordPress, you can use a, a WordPress NPM package. Um, all of that's kind of there for you to piece together yourself. Um, ultimately, it shouldn't be, you know, I think what we've, most of the things we've talked about, it's like, oh, wouldn't it be great if this was just really simple? Um, ultimately, that's where we want to get to, where WordPress can be integrated with, you know, a single click of some button or, a, you know, Astro set up WordPress and walking you through that. But we're still a long ways off um, from that. And also, um, eventually, at the end of the day, if you're building the e-commerce site, it's really hard to get static sites working. And e-commerce is probably one of the bigger content-based use cases out there um, based on kind of traffic today. So having some sort of dynamic thing that we can run in the cloud for you um, is very much top of mind for us. You know, we want to stay true to our static site builder roots, but that's an undeniable kind of use case, even if you're building a content-focused site. So Eleventy seems to have done a good job with their new serverless mode, which kind of walks the line between injecting a little bit of magic like that for the server. Um, we're excited to explore something similar for Astro. In my head, I'm like trying to put that together, like what that might look like from content building to dyna dynamic, uh, like, would that be like, uh, you know, when we're talking about e-commerce and, and loading that content, there's a need to sort of reload new content as inventory changes and yep. things like that. Uh, so would you consider those items to be sort of dynamic, like uh, a level of inventory or out of stock, a dynamic component or a trigger to rebuild? It's kind of up to you. I think what we really want to support, I mean, both is, is kind of the, the short answer, but what we want to support the same idea of a user comes to my site and we generate this response for them automatically. Um, that doesn't actually have to change a lot about how Astro is you know, designed. It's still going to give you that great performance story. It's going to give you that like content optimized story. But we can just generate that response actually in a server instead of before you go to build. 
Um, there's, I think Netlify has done probably the most talking about this idea where static builds and server builds, it's all just a question of where you build and then where you cache it. And so internally, we're doing a lot of refactoring. We want our build to be performant, which means the same thing as it does for in your server, you want it to run quickly. Um, so a lot of the same benefits of doing that work actually benefit the person who still wants to build their whole site ahead of time. Um, the overlap there is actually a lot larger than people think in that at the end of the day, all you're doing is like a request comes in, either from my build tool or from a user actually hitting my route. I want to generate the HTML and send it back to that uh, output, whether that's the build director you're ultimately later going to deploy or the user is still waiting there for their response. Um, it's just a question of where that logic runs. So today it all runs on your machine or in your CI for your build. In that case, you're deploying the static assets. Um, what we're all really interested in is, is there a way that could live alongside an actual function that can run in Vercel, in Netlify, on AWS, in Cloudflare, and running on the edge? That would be so cool. Um, there's some really cool stuff. We just want to kind of create the tool that then others can go and deploy it anywhere they want. Now, in that migration from, you know, in that idea of being able to to do like. Uh, the agnostic or abstraction of the build, whether it's all of it on my machine or just a diff cut on a function based on a server request, uh, is that? Pardon me, Feeks. Is that the you know one of the questions that I had for you when sitting down to think about this? Is you when Astro Build moved from uh, was it Snowpack to Beat? Mm -hmm. What yep. was was that part of the precipice like? So you, you're not to 1.0 yet, and you have rewritten the entire build step um, in front of a 1.0 build to, to get to stability. Um, why? <laughs> it, it, it's it, a great question. Is, like, <laughs> didn't you and the team like write Snowpack? Yeah. Like, isn't it an intimate tool of, of, of that you know so well? I'm, I'm really curious when you sit down with yourself and go, this is something that I built and worked on and know so well. I'm just going to set that over there and I'm going to pull this in and rewrite like it sounds uh, on the surface uh, difficult to understand. Um, what went into that decision? Um, maybe in the serverless talk, we're starting to get into a little bit, but help me understand like what were you guys thinking? Because it's, oh, it, it's, work. it's even more work than it sounds. At the same time, we also rebuilt our compiler from a fork of the Svelte compiler into something that we had kind of could control and build ourselves. So two huge rewrites, essentially of ground up rewrite of Astro before V1. Um, the before V1 point, I think was mainly just, we wanted to do that thrash sooner rather than later if we were gonna do it at all. Um, but then the why for the Snowpack part was just that Snowpack and Veed kind of came up at the same time. Um, I think like within the span of a week, both Evan Yu of, of uh, Vue.js, who's who created Veed originally, um, and myself had both posted about this idea. I think Snowpack went back further, but really this like dev server build that was all ESM, um, both were born around the same time. And it had been a full-time focus and then a part-time focus. And then it, had, you know, I was kind of just like when I could working on it. And Evan was just heads down on V. So a year later, looking at the two, Snowpack, we were struggling to build Snowpack and Astro at the same time. And meanwhile, Vite was just, you know, rocket ship up. It did a great job of executing on what they were trying to do. It was a really good version of what Snowpack was also trying to do. So it kind of came time where we realized we were splitting our attention and, and as a result, not building the Astro that we wanted to build because we had to go and add source map support to Snowpack, which is something we'd been kicking the can on and um, documenting a bunch of things that we'd been playing around with but never formalized. It was, it just became too much for our team of, of already limited contributors and, and uh, members to manage. So that was a tough decision as the person who created Snowpack because we were really the biggest users of it at that time. But um, we certainly, at the point when we made that decision, kind of saw the writing on the wall with the momentum that Vite had built. And it wasn't a hill we had to die on. It's, you know, kind of speaks to the interoperability of this layer of the, of the uh, space where if Vite can do exactly what Snowpack was doing um, and we can leverage that, and now there's a whole team kind of powering Astro um, you know, they're shipping releases and new versions. We don't even have to know about that. Um, that's certainly a win for us, even if it is a, you know, upfront cost of moving. I feel, I feel like Beat has probably shipped two versions since we started uh, our conversation. <laughs> they really did. 
and just a rocket speed. Like yeah. they're hard to even just keep up with. Uh, and that that is a great. I mean, I I really had a front row seat to it because I was watching as they grew while we grew. Um, but even going back and trying to chart how over such a short amount of time, I mean, it really was Evan just built a great community, uh, brought in great people from the view community. So they were jump started quickly, um, a ton of momentum there and excitement there as they built it. And I don't know how involved Evan is anymore. It's really, I think, this like self-sustaining thing because he did such a good job building a team around it. So, um, yeah, I've been very impressed by that project. I think it really speaks to the power of open source community um, when you can leverage one that you already have, but also really invest in the people who build the tool. Talking about 1.0, um, can I ask you the incredibly cursed question of <laughs> how, how far do you think you are from, from 1.0? If, if there are people watching this that are like, oh, this sounds really interesting, but we want it to be stable. Yeah, I mean, stability is really the only thing we're focusing on now. So those kind of last breaking changes, if we have to make them, we're going to try and make those sooner rather than later. Um, so within a month of hearing this is probably a great time to check out, even if you're worried about stability. Um, we're really ironing those last details out. Um, but, you know, if you're cautious and don't want to invest in anything too soon, um, we'll have a beta, we'll have a release candidate, all those things that are kind of signaling this is stable. Um, you know, we're not making major changes going forward. So we're still exploring. There's still a couple that we have on deck. But um, if you're just trying to play around with it, and even if you are, you know, there are plenty of production sites on it today. Um, we're not monsters. We're not just breaking things without. We understand the weight of the community. Um, you know, Remix was beta for a very long time up until a couple of weeks ago, I think. Svelte Kit is currently still beta before 1.0. So it's one of those things where once you have users, it kind of doesn't mean as much. Um, we're really trying to be good to our current users. And if we do have to make breaking changes before 1.0, um, really messaging them well and giving you deprecation notices and, and flags to enable or disable behavior. Um, so it is still a very safe and kind of stable um, experience in that way. But there's a few more changes we want to make before 1.0 that are holding us back. Are those API improvements or are there are there features like when you think about 1.0, is it, okay, I'm going to have these 12 features and a stable core to work with and that's a 1.0, ready, go. Uh, or is it more like, hmm, when, when July comes around, it'll be 1.0. Like, it, I, I feel like everyone has sort of their own sort of mental model of what that moniker means. Yeah. What is it's, it for you? Yeah, it's it's really, you can fall into a really dangerous trap if it's always one more feature, one more feature, one more feature. Um, I'd say for us, the buckets that we're focused on are stability. Um, so just making sure the developer experience is really easy to use for a new user, which is one of those things where it's like a thousand paper cuts that might not even be bugs, but just, you know, is this error message super clear? Does this guide you to you know, know what you need to do to fix it? Um, that's a big part of stability in my mind and, and how easy it is to you know, not feel lost when you pick up Astro for the first time. Um, other than that, just more API changes in terms of finalizing default behavior. Um, we have this ethos of doing everything, kind of helping you do the right thing, um, the right thing by default. So things like optimizing and bundling assets for you automatically. Um, is one of the you know, kind of most frustrating thing coming from other site builders um, that Next.js and others get really right, which is, I don't want to think about optimization. That's, why can't you all do that for me as the tool itself? You know my assets, you know what I'm building. Um, we have a lot of power in Astro, but the defaults I think are still being finalized in terms of what you get out of the box versus what you have to enable and trying to be as optimized as possible out of the box. And then the third is is the more kind of shiny of them, which is just, are there features we can add that aren't actually that hard to add? Oddly, the refactoring is probably where we spend 90% of our time. And new features are like, oh yeah, this works. Someone tried this out in user land. It's a new image component. Here you go. Um, or a font component that like kind of optimizes your Google fonts. All those things are like really, I think what people at the end of the day are looking for in addition to stability. And oddly enough, probably take a fraction of the time of getting the core language and the core functionality right. Um, so we'll try and get a couple of those really fun ones in um, as long as they're not, you know, the, the kind of uh, what's the Hydra, right? Where you cut one off and then two more get added and you never end up shipping. Uh, we're at least conscious of that problem and trying to cut that off uh, at a certain number. So recently you had some big news. Uh, and by recently, I mean literally hours ago. Um, <laughs> yeah, not planned at all. <laughs> Just a happy coincidence. Um, Tom, you came across this article, right? Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, I think it was a little after 
3 p.m. Eastern time, uh, Astro has received quite a bit of funding. So congratulations. Uh, Fred, would you like to tell us a little more about that? Yeah, thank you. It's it's huge news for the project. Um, and just, you know, we really are excited about what this means for the open source community and for everything we've built so far. Um, so a couple of us, the reason Astro has been able to grow as quickly as it has is um, because a lot of us have been able to work on it full time. So we came out of this project called a Skypack, which was previously called Pika, and was trying to build a, a CDM that was really focused on modern JavaScript. And as we were working on that, Astro was this kind of side project that just grew and grew and grew. And so we've recently, just as a group, recommitted to Astro, forming a company to support it, and really investing in it as a platform, not just a build tool. So really trying to see it um, grow and how this company can just support the growth of this open source tool. Um, this really unlocks a lot of doors for us in terms of how quickly we can move for our users and for everyone who uses Astro. Um, so yeah, really excited. It's been a long time coming and um, you know, it's, it's kind of just a key part of building a big project, the size that we want to achieve here. Um, you know, it's, it's something that really helps make that possible by letting people work on it full time and uh, fixing bugs, growing features. And yeah, really excited about it. That's fantastic. So we can look forward to, you know, uh, Astro Comp 2023, um, Astro Swag, and, uh, <laughs> you know, plenty of, of, of built with Astro uh, monikers and tags um, in the future. Yeah, I've got some stickers to send you. You just tell me the address. I already got them. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm a sucker. We're all suckers for stickers. <laughs> of course. Who are we kidding? Um, yeah, no, it, it's really, I think it just... Um, you touched on a couple of things of where Astro can go from here and um, even talking about like what a WordPress developer wants. I think there's a lot of that that we want to tackle if we can, uh, but just like the resources to do it. Um, I mean, a built-in CMS is a huge undertaking, so we wouldn't go into that lightly, but certain things that, um, that could be built either alongside Astro or in support of Astro uh, to kind of help you build better things with the open source tool are very much top of mind. So Tailwind is a huge inspiration. I think they've done a great job of building things as a company that aren't limiting in any way. It's 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 actually supporting more Tailwind users come to Tailwind through its UI product, which is paid. Um, and just that idea of how can our company exist to support the project as a platform that we all build on top of. Um, that's what gets me really excited. So yeah, this is a, a huge milestone for the project. Jerry, were you going to say something? Me? No. No. Um, yeah. Well, obviously, the other thing we can do with this is hire more people to work on Astro. So that's my plug for the episode. Um, if you're interested in working on DevTools, working with Astro, if you've played around with it and love it, um, please don't hesitate to reach out on any service, email, Twitter, et cetera. Um, we're growing the team and really excited to do it. That's fantastic. And how is the Astro community? I, I know, um, how is it uh, building that community? I, I've seen uh, the Discord and the, the GitHub and the, the Wiki and stuff like that. Is there uh, effort, like when you're building a product, like I can sit and, and tool away at my desk and that's a certain sort of mental load. Is building a community, I, I know it's difficult and hard. Is it exhausting? And, um, you know, do you, you, you guys seem to be doing a pretty good job of it so far. Is, is it a struggle? Is it, uh, how, how is your experience in community building? Um, yeah, it's, it's a huge undertaking, but a huge reward uh, when you get it right. And this is probably the first time I feel like I've gotten close to whatever right looks like after building a, you know, a couple of projects that uh, experimenting with different. Yeah, we were early on Discord, which I think was a really good choice. Um, in terms of just a really good platform and also plenty of ways to extend it and make it your own. So we have great bots that kind of help with support. Um, they recently added events so we can do our weekly community call kind of built into Discord and on their um, you know, live audio chat that anyone can join. There's a ton of cool stuff that we get out of that. Um, but they kind of give us the tools and it's just kind of on you to really focus on it as one of the key reasons that your project exists is to help the people who are coming to you and. Um, once you start thinking that way, it really helps kind of realize that that's one of the more important things. Um, you know, a, a project with no community is just kind of, there are plenty of repos on GitHub that fall into that trap of just existing, but um, we're in a very fortunate position where you know, our 
users are the same developers who can help us build it and grow it, who can give really good feedback. Um, you know, it's a pretty one-to-one -one connection between our users and the people who are part of our open source community. So we're very lucky in that regard that, you know, we can not just launch a new feature and get feedback immediately, but even like throw an idea out there, like, hey, how do you all feel about that? And get that feedback that we'd never even thought of. Uh, there have been separate ideas, several ideas that I've pitched, which like just weren't accepted. And it was like one of the best feelings because it's like, oh, this is good. Feel like how good to get this feedback now versus spending a bunch of time and building it. And then everyone hates it. Um, it's one of the most powerful things that I think we've built here. And I'm, I'm really excited to keep investing in it. That is super fantastic. I'm super excited for you guys to see your work. The, the new site looks fantastic. Uh, I like the uh, the 8-bit retrograde going, <laughs> going all the way back to just HTML and CSS. Uh, whose idea was the marquee, not a marquee ticker at the top? <laughs> um, that idea and also the entire website was built by Nate Moore, um, one of the kind of core members on the team. Um, he's got great design chops and, and yeah, that marquee is fantastic. Um, yeah, I, as soon as I saw it, I had to open it and be like, the marquee tag is deprecated. <laughs> What's going, like, it was the first thing I thought of. And I was like, that, that's deprecated. Like, as far as much as HTML tags get deprecated. I was I like, know. What, is going, what is going on up here? I don't know how they got away with deprecating that. One of the most fun tags. <laughs> um, I think we were able to build our own version of it pretty quickly. But as far as I know, it's all CSS and HTML. I think it's actually not a single line of JavaScript to power that thing. I think. That's amazing. Yeah, Nate's, Nate's awesome. Yeah, he did. Nate did a fantastic job. Fantastic job, Nate. It looks it looks uh, absolutely fantastic. Um, is there anything else as we wrap up, Fred? Is there anything that you want to to plug? I know the the community get into the Discord. You you said you have weekly chats yeah. in the Discord. If I jump in there, Tuesday at eleven PST, we'll have a weekly call where we go over RFCs. So basically, like requests for comment, uh, different ideas that have been pitched. And also add a bunch of time at the end to just kind of hang out, get to meet our community, get to answer questions, ask questions. It's a fun time. Nice. And if uh, any of us are interested in diving in and contributing, uh, sort of uh, really getting involved, is there, where would we start? Is there, where would we start? Yeah, um, our GitHub, you know, obviously has everything, but our Discord also has a great, uh, like getting started community. So there's a channel called Start Contributing where you can jump in, or if you hate Discord, never want to touch it, Feel free to just join us on GitHub, um, comment on any issue, and we'll we'll help you out. It's um, helping onboard new users and new contributors, um, not just to Astro, but to like feeling comfortable in open source. Um, it's been such a powerful tool for all of us as individuals that we really want to support um, being good stewards of open source as an ethos. So, yeah, we're trying to be the best community we can, and it's a really welcoming place for new developers or people who are new to the open source way of doing development. Awesome. I feel like at this point there's like a limited uh, number of rows in my Discord and uh, communities, like I'm fighting with which ones I wanna be active in to keep the, the slots full. It's like memory slots in my old video games. <laughs> it's like, I really wanna join this one, but I have to kick somebody out because I just I can't handle <laughs> the like running icons of, of servers down the side. Right, that you joined three years ago and you don't know why they're there, yeah. Yeah, you're like, I don't even know what that one's for. Um, <laughs> Just a person's face? Natural. Is that a community for that person's face? Yeah. <laughs> Plenty of those. Um, My yeah, uh, old man yells at cloud uh, opinion. Bring back forums. Yes. You're not the first person in our community. It's a, a real love-hate. Discord gives us a ton. But one of the things we do is we do support through Discord. So once someone gets help, there's like no record of that. Um, we're trying to fix that. We're trying to have some like export to GitHub so that the whole thing becomes a GitHub issue. Um, but yeah, we're definitely pushing the limits of Discord and, and enjoying a lot of it, but plenty of room to go. Um, by the way, our domain is astro.build. If any of this sounds exciting, all the links to everything we've talked about are on there. Yes, go check out the uh, astro.build um, and check out the marquee at the top. It is uh, amazing. Uh, Fred, thank you so much for your time today. Um, congratulations on all your success so far and, and the community and the team's hard work. Um, it's really paid off. It looks fantastic. Uh, I'm super excited and already converting my stuff, as I hope most of our viewers will. So thank you so much, everyone, for watching. This has been Build It Better uh, with Fred from Astro Build with Jay and Tom. Everyone say goodbye. <laughs>